Hello there, welcome to today's webinar from Aerospace to Autonomous Systems Tactical Grade IMU for Demanding Applications, sponsored by Inside GNSS, Inside Unmanned Systems, and SBG Systems. I'm Lori Dearman, Senior Webinar Producer with WebAttract, and I'll be one of your moderators for today's session. And in just a moment, we'll be introducing our panel of thought leaders who will describe the Pulse 40 new miniature MEMS-based tactical grade inertial measurement unit designed and developed by SBG Systems for demanding applications spanning aerospace to autonomous systems. You'll also have an opportunity to have your questions answered at midpoint and at the end of the presentation during the Ask the Expert panel session with all three of our panelists. Now, we've invited you along with over 200 professionals from 42 countries representing a variety of industries. And over the next 90 minutes, regardless of your industry segment or your location, we're confident that you'll find today's webinar to be of value. Now, before we get started, Richard Fisher, publisher inside GNSS and inside Unmanned Systems, would like to take just a moment to welcome you and introduce our main moderator for today's session. Richard? Lori, thanks. Thank you. So on behalf of Inside GNSS, Inside Unmanned Systems, and our sponsor, SBG, I extend a warm welcome to our audience from around the world for today's webinar. We are delighted you're here today to learn more about this exciting launch, and we appreciate SBG launching their Pulse 40 um, with the Inside GNSS and Inside Unmanned Systems media brands. Now I'd like to introduce our moderator for today, Alan Cameron. Alan, the floor is yours. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, Lori. And welcome to everyone around the world. We have an exciting webinar in store for you. And we'll go deep into technical details of inertial technology. Uh, you have a brief glance here at our panelists from SVG Systems. and. Uh, we're going to hear from the Chief Technology Officer, uh, the Business Development Officer, and the Test and Qualifications Engineer. I will introduce each one of them in turn when it's time to speak. But right now, uh, Lori, let's have a bit of speaking from the audience. Absolutely. And uh, coming up on your screen is going to be our very first poll of the day. We would like to hear from each of you. Uh, what IMU application or applications are you working on? And in this case, we are asking you to select all that apply, navigation, integration with GNSS, antenna, camera stabilization, mapping survey, robotics, aerospace defense. So it looks like we are coming in with 71% navigation, uh, integration with GNSS, 24% antenna, camera stabilization, 44% coming in with mapping survey, 29% robotics, and 34% aerospace defense. So, uh, Alan, any thoughts here? Well, other than telling the audience that uh, all of you are in the right place to learn more about uh, your applications, I'm going to defer to one of our panelists. And members of the audience, you have not been formally introduced to Alexis Kinama, but uh, we're going to hear from him briefly. Then I will introduce him. Alexis. Um, do you have any comments on the on the distribution of the applications that you're seeing here? Does this reflect your uh, client base or the uh, or the general industry? Uh, what can you tell us? Um, I, I would say that uh, in an uh, an interesting uh, split of the applications. Um, uh, what I uh, what I see is that. Uh, all the navigation uh, applications and mapping survey application require um, a very high precision uh, IMU to, to operate properly. Uh, and so uh, that's a, a very, very nice insight. Um, more generally, uh, these applications are very uh, uh, common to, uh, to SBG systems. Uh, we will see uh, right after how the, the, the Pulse 40 can answer to, uh, to these markets. But uh, yeah, that's a very, inter very interesting uh, insight. Thank you for that preview, Alexis. All right, audience, now, now is your turn to, to meet Alexis properly. He is the Chief Technology Officer and co-founder of, of SBG Systems, a supplier of miniature high-performance inertial navigation systems. He holds a Master's of Science degree in Embedded Systems from École Centrale d'Electronique, 
and for the past decade he has led the development of cutting-edge navigation algorithms and hardware including attitude and heading reference systems, inertial measurement units, inertial navigation systems with embedded GPS, and more at SBG Systems. Alexis, please tell us about the Pulse 40. Thank you, Alan. Uh, I'm really uh, excited to, uh, to present this, uh, this new Pulse 40 uh, uh, into, this, uh, into this webinar. Um, I'm going to start my talk uh, by presenting our company for those who are not so familiar with uh, SBG. And then also uh, I will present uh, our expertise in the inertial uh, uh, systems. And then of course I will, uh, I will go into the Pulse 40 presentation uh, and, and uh, give a brief overview of the manufacturing process. Uh, but the manufacturing process will be uh, much more detailed by uh, uh, the next uh, speaker, Emric. But before starting, I wanted to, um, to, to, uh, to highlight uh, some common mistakes uh, that are made when uh, considering MEMS, IMU design. Um, so the first mistake is uh, that uh, uh, you, many people think that uh, you can just buy a 3x3 three three millimeter sensor chip uh, that is uh, really uh, widely available on the market now, and then you, you, you will make an IMU out of that. Um, it's important to know that uh, the vast majority of the MEMS IMU are now produced uh, and designed for consumer applications. So they usually uh, have some nice characteristics, for instance, uh, they have a low noise. Uh, they are excellent sensors for uh, gesture analysis, uh, for simple camera stabilization, but it doesn't make an IMU. Um, um, if you want to have a high precision, if you want to address high precision application, you will need uh, to integrate a lot more uh, intelligence uh, aside from, from, this, uh, from this sensor chip. Uh, you will need uh, to, to address the very high sensor to sensor performance discrepancy. So uh, one uh, sensor combo doesn't behave exactly like the, the, another one. Um, all these designs do not consider the long-term stability. Uh, they have no sensor calibration at all embedded. They have no mechanical integration. Much care needs to be, uh, to be done on that aspect. And no advanced signal processing are embedded into these, uh, uh, these uh, sensor combos. The other uh, common mistake is just looking at the Allen variance, uh, angular random walk, and bias instability, and then consider this is the only factor that you need to, uh, uh, to check when comparing to, to IMUs. Um, here it's, a, it's an example of a, of a sensor that you may find on the, on the market, actually, uh, which provides um, an excellent uh, bias instability. The, the, the curve is going down very, very well. But if you look at the right side of the curve, then you will see that it, it goes up dramatically um, right after. And so uh, uh, only after 100 seconds of integration, you already uh, increase the noise. And so it, you won't get much performance out of this sensor. So, uh, I wanted to remind that Allen Variance is the next excellent tool for sensor performance measurement, but it's not the only parameter to look at. Uh, the random walk, um, the rate random walk, random walk, which is the, 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 the rate of uh, increase of this Allen Variance curve, it's also an important factor. Um, and other parameters like startup bias, long-term stability, vibration rectification errors, need to be considered if you want to uh, know how your IMU will behave in the, in the real world. But uh, yeah, let me give you some, some introduction about SBG systems. So uh, we are a leading supplier of orientation, stabilization, and navigation solutions. We are headquartered uh, in France, and we have an international presence more than 800 customers um, over the world, and more than 25,000 uh, inertial sensors on the field. 
And if we go back to the um, to uh, uh, history of SBG uh, back in 2007 when we uh, started the, the company, uh, at the very beginning of the of our history, we we knew that it was a key um, to uh, to invest a lot of efforts in uh, in calibration uh, of inertial sensors. So. Uh, the very first inertial systems that we delivered were already calibrated in, an, in a fully automated and industrial motion simulator with temperature compensation. Over the years, we introduced various um, improvements in our tools. This allowed us to, uh, to, uh, to release high-performance inertial navigation systems, the Equinox, Ellipse, Apogee, uh, and then um, in 2017 and, and the years after, we uh, introduced our new facility with the two axis uh, rotary tables with temperature chambers. This allowed us to uh, implement a 100% automated calibration process with no uh, human interve inter intervention during the whole calibration process. Um, so. Um, that, this is really important to understand that because initially we were uh, developing mainly inertial navigation systems, but we always had IMUs inside our products. So that uh, becomes quite natural for us to, uh, to, to, to release on the market an IMU uh, to, to take all the benefits of our expertise in the uh, inertial sensors uh, calibration and sampling and integration. So, what what are the fields of expertise you need if you want to make a good IMU? Um, the first aspect, which is really important, is the MEMS uh, MEMS sensor itself. Of course, it's really important. So at SBG, we don't develop the MEMS elements, but we we have uh, selected partners. Um, uh, which uh, we qualified uh, using a very, very deep qualification process. So uh, we know exactly how the sensor behaves. We have also um, um, an expertise in mechatronics, electronics design. Of course, this is a key to develop a, a, a miniature IMU. Also, um, an expertise in signal processing. That's also a key to ensure that you have a proper behavior in all conditions especially in vibrating environments. Calibration uh, algorithms, expertise is uh, also mandatory if you want to make sure that the, the system will behave uh, perfectly fine in all the, the temperature conditions, all the dynamics. And something that makes uh, SBG somewhat different from other IMU manufacturers is that we also have some expertise in inertial navigation. Uh, since we developed uh, INS systems for more than 15 years, uh, we know exactly what we need uh, in terms of IMU performance parameters. We are also an end user of this IMU. So we need the best IMU and we want it uh, on, with the Pulse 40 to get the best uh, IMU possible. And uh, yeah, that's probably something uh, uh, really important to, uh, uh, to see SBG as a uh, a leading supplier of, uh, of IMUs. Um, now, why we, did we design a new tactical grade IMU? What, was, what was our um, main requirements? So we wanted to, to develop a new IMU, of course, for high performance markets. This was really our initial focus. Um, we wanted to have something really compact, really robust, uh, and really capable of uh, operating in really constrained applications. Um, of course, we wanted to leverage on our expertise in uh, inertial uh, sensors. And, um, and finally, we wanted to have a sensor that would be easy to integrate, something that you could, for instance, just plug on a PCB. Uh, with a board-to-board -board interface would be uh, really, really fine for that purpose. So let me uh, present you the, the Pulse 40. So uh, the Pulse 40 is a six degrees of freedom IMU composed of a, a redundant set of uh, three-axis gyroscopes, accelerometers, 
We also embed a temperature sensor to, uh, to allow the, the thermal calibration, of course. Uh, we have an internal um, clock that uh, runs the sampling uh, internally at uh, so that there is a, a, a high frequency sampling on the gyros accelerometers at more than five, uh, four kilohertz for accelerometers and six kilohertz for gyros. And the main loop runs at two kilohertz for the, all the calibration process. A continuous built-in test ensures that we deliver uh, data that, that is uh, uh, verified at some point. So we, we are pretty sure that uh, we deliver valid IMU information and we, uh, we can warn the user if there is any problem on the IMU measurements. The system can be synchronized. We will uh, talk about this uh, later on. We have a single UART interface, a very simple uh, interfacing scheme. Um, so as I, as I mentioned, uh, initially we wanted to have something easy to, to interface, uh, something also very, very small. So we developed an IMU with an optimal swap, uh, also optimal cost. We will, uh, we will see that. Uh, the direct PCB mounting makes it really uh, straightforward to, to integrate your, this IMU into, into, uh, um, into the customer application. 30 by 28 but by 13 millimeters size, less than 12 grams. Um, that's a, a very small uh, device um, for sure. And as I mentioned, we have a UART uh, TTL interface. Um, the mechanical and environmental specifications are also very uh, interesting. So the, the sensor is qualified uh, from minus 40 to plus 85 degrees Celsius. Uh, it's important to know that this spec uh, applies for the storage, the operating conditions, but also the, the fully qualified uh, condition. Sometimes the, the, the calibration range is uh, quite limited, but here we have uh, the, the, the full performance that is guaranteed over this full temperature range. Uh, we can handle uh, 10 Gs of uh, vibrations, operate uh, um, under strong shocks, and we have also a survivability of uh, 1,500 uh, Gs. As you can see uh, on the pictures on the, on the right, uh, many tests has, have been done in uh, uh, shakers in temperature chambers and so on to ensure that the system is behaving exactly uh, how we want. Uh, Emric uh, is going to talk much more about that. Um, regarding the performance, we have a cutting edge MEMS design uh, that enables an excellent noise uh, and bias instability um, and a ultra low vibration rectification error. Uh, which allows the, this IMU to operate in very harsh conditions. Um, so the gyro can operate up to uh, 490 degrees per second and the accelerometer up to 40 G. Um, it's important to know that this system has uh, no export restrictions, but we still have a higher, higher range on the gyro option with 2,000 2, degrees per second, uh, but this unit is, uh, is export controlled. Um, so the, the, the uh, in-run in bias instability uh, of 0 0.8 degree per hour on the gyro, uh, which, which enables a tactical grade level, and 6 micro G for the accelerometer. Um, and another important parameter is the high bandwidth and the low latency of the, of the sensor, uh, which allows uh, operation in highly dynamic environments. Um, also, optimal performance if you have uh, if you have uh, uh, yeah if you have uh, high dynamic motion uh, acceleration coupled with rotations, then you can you can and you can maintain a, a proper performance. Um, that's uh, really important. And uh, as I mentioned, yeah, the, the VRE uh, very low, 0 0.2 degree per g square. Uh, degree per hour per G square on the gyro and 30 micro G per G squared on the accelerometer. Some uh, some figures now. Um, you can see here the the gyroscope um, Allen variants that we've made on 
more than 30 gyros, I think. Uh, you can see that it, the, the, the sensors uh, are really repeatable, uh, really consistent uh, to each other. And uh, we see that the bottom of the Allen variance uh, is, uh, is reached uh, around um, two uh, or 300 seconds. And it, it doesn't go up very fast right after. So that's really, uh, that means that the bias of the gyro will remain quite stable over long periods of integration, which is really important, especially when you consider INS uh, applications or mapping applications. Uh, this will enable um, low heading drift, for instance. Same figure for the accelerometer. Um, uh, once again, the, the, the stability uh, is, is really good and uh, doesn't go up on the right. Uh, so that's uh, uh, very interesting uh, to, to, uh, to enable uh, long-term navigation applications. Um, then we show the, the temperature uh, sweep tests. Um, you can see that the gyro remains really, really stable uh, or when exposed to, uh, to temperature variations um, with, uh, with a variation of around 50 uh, degrees per hour or something. So very, very uh, constrained uh, variations of the gyro bias. And for the accelerometer, we have uh, pretty much uh, uh, the same behavior with very, very stable performance over the full temperature range, um, less than 200 micro G uh, variation. So very, very interesting. Um, I wanted also to highlight the clock modes of this IMU. Uh, we, we designed uh, the Pulse 40 to be as easy as integrate, uh, as, e as easy as possible to integrate. So both on the hardware side, uh, to plug in on, on a PCB, but also on the software side. Um, so the, the clock synchronization um, has been designed. So you have different modes. Either you can run uh, a, with the internal clock of the uh, IMU. So in that case, the inter uh, internal clock uh, generates a 2 kilohertz uh, sampling and signal processing uh, main loop. And then you can deliver the output up to 2 kilohertz, but uh, you can also select uh, the output data rate out of that. Um, in this mode, you can enable an optional uh, sync out uh, square waveform to synchronize your system with exactly the, uh, the, 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 the samples uh, time. But you can also uh, do it uh, the other way. Uh, if you want to synchronize, for instance, your GPS uh, receiver, your GNSS receiver uh, on the IMU, you can have access to a one PPS signal, for instance. And then you can, you can put this PPS signal on, uh, on the clock input. And we will scale automatically the, the, the clock input to generate internally the two kilohertz that can be uh, perfectly aligned on the top of a second, for instance. You can also uh, input your own 2 kilohertz input to completely bypass the, the internal clock. So uh, many, many uh, possibilities to interface the, the, the pulse on your, on your system. Um, a brief introduction of the manufacturing. Uh, this is, uh, um, we developed a 100% automated calibration process uh, on our two-axis rotary tables. So um, uh, Emric will talk much more about that, but this is really uh, an important aspect on the, on the Pulse 40 and all the other uh, systems that we deliver at SBG Systems. Um, we deliver with each sensor uh, a calibration and a validation report, sorry which uh, um, guarantees the performance level of the IMU. Um, and uh, also this fully automated process minimize any, any quality issues um, since we, we limit all the human interventions to the minimum level. Uh, the risk of mistakes is really, really low. Um, we have a screening process uh, that makes it possible to uh, take away any sensor that, that is not uh, fully compliant with the specs. 
Um, this slide will conclude my presentation, so back to you, Alan. Thank you, Alexis. All right, uh, members of the audience, you've heard about the Pulse 40, its, uh, its particularities, its particulars, excuse me. Uh, now we're going to look at the applications, and for that we'll turn to Sean McGuigan. Sean is responsible for business development in the aerospace and defense markets at SBG Systems. He holds a PhD in nuclear magnetism from the University of Kent at Canterbury in England. Sean has extensive experience in the development of micro electromechanical systems and ring laser gyroscope based inertial systems with L3 communications and Honeywell, as well as the development and integration of SASM GPS receivers. More recently, he worked as a consultant for companies such as Sensinor, Crossbow Technologies, IX Blue, and PolyExplore. He joined the business development team at SBG Systems in July of last year. Sean, we're all anxious to hear about applications. Please proceed. Hey, good morning, Alan. And thank you for that uh, glowing introduction. I really appreciate it. Yeah, so today we're going to talk about this um, exciting new product from SBG Systems, the Pulse 40 IMU. This uh, product, uh, as I like to say, is designed uh, so that your system design doesn't flatline and actually has a good pulse. And what we're going to talk about in this section primarily today are the uh, some of the things that maybe are related to the first uh, poll question. We're going to talk about markets, competitive advantages, um, why this is a tactical grade IMU, and then what the uh, key benefits and features are of this brand new product from SPG Systems. So just to frame what it is we're talking about here uh, in just one chart, uh, this is the Pulse 40. It's a miniature MEMS-based IMU, uh, the first one of its kind from SBG Systems, and we're very excited that this product is coming to market this month, and we have a lot of optimism uh, that uh, this product will be widely adopted uh, for a wide range of applications, as highlighted in the, in the first poll question. So on the left-hand side, we have some of the key benefits of the Pulse 40 IMU, sort of more of the, uh, some quantitative, some qualitative. It's um, one thing that's particularly, I think, going to be valuable, particularly to this international audience that we have here today, is the fact that this is an ITAR-free product. So don't have to worry about that when you place an order with, uh, with SPG systems in France. Obviously, there are some export restrictions on the 2,000 degree per second uh, variant of this product, but it's nothing like ITAR, believe me. This product also comes um, unusually, uh, especially when compared with the next best alternatives. It comes with a two-year warranty, and that's straight out of the box. You don't have to pay extra money for an extra year, as a lot of people do these days uh, request you to do. So um, please keep that in mind when you're looking at this product versus others. It's MIL standard A10G qualified, um, which is uh, extremely good for a product of this nature. And you will find, once you contact our sales organization, uh, hopefully immediately after this webinar, that this is an extremely cost-effective product as well. There's some great tactical, technical features, as highlighted on the right-hand side. It's 0.8 degrees per hour, which makes it tactical grade, so one degree an hour. A very good performance from the gyro drift standpoint. It's very low weight, 20 grams. Um, you can hardly even know you've got it in your system. 11 cubic centimeter volume, again, minimal and only 0.3 watt continuous power draw. So obviously, this is great for people who want to do deep integration. You can put, as Alexis said earlier on in his presentation, you can put this IMU directly on your circuit card assembly, integrate it with your GNS receiver, uh, your signal processing um, software, and you've got an entire integrated system in a very low volume for very low power. Okay, changing gears just slightly here, um, we're going to look here at the MEMS inertial market expansion that's taken place over the last oh, decade or so, and uh, also sort of um, show you where SBG Systems plays in the overall uh, navigation industry, and then more specifically with respect to MEMS. So this plot here, it's a little busy, my apologies. On the left, what I've tried to uh, highlight here is requirements for IMUs, um, and there's again a qualitative, it's sort of from value added such as consumer products up to 
um, what you might call critical to human life, such as space flight, human space flight. And obviously the requirements the, uh, are different, uh, very different, depending on what the application space is. And that's plotted against and along the bottom performance. And you might hear, you might think of something like uh, in-run gyro biostability as being a performance number that would typically differentiate between these different types of grades of product. Again, from the lower left uh, personal nav section up to the upper right, which is you know strategic grade. You're looking at very big ring laser gyros, very large fiber optic gyros, things like that in that in that uh, particular segment. Where SBG plays primarily is in the oval, the kind of the canted oval in the middle of the chart. Um, we cover the most of the center of the marketplace there, um, and it's right now is probably one of the largest. Uh, fastest growing regions uh, of the entire marketplace and we certainly think it's a great place to be and that at the the new pulse 40 IMU kind of fits uh, slap bang in the middle of this market expansion area uh, there are some markets here that it's not necessarily specifically designed uh, to address immediately uh, that may be changed in the future depending on what the demands are on this product um, but most of the areas that you see on this chart um, are going to be covered by this particular product and as you can see performance is is creeping up um, beyond tactical grade and starting to encroach on um, applications such as low earth orbit satellites um, you know, military uh, ground vehicle navigation and things like that that have typically been the domain of other sensor technologies in the past okay so the target markets uh, for the Pulse 40 IMU, um, and we we um, we can talk about this more um, if we get more questions on it. Hopefully, uh, highlighted on the right hand side of this chart, um, and we've got marine, aerospace, and industrial. This uh, product is suitable for certain defense applications. Um, it was not specifically designed for defense applications, in that there are certain things that certain defense applications require, such as. 20 years storage life or salt and spray protection have not been addressed with this initial release. Um, that doesn't mean they won't be as we go forward, but um, this product would have to be integrated, deeply integrated into a system to make it suitable for those kinds of um, end uses. We are primarily right now focusing on things like platform stabilization, navigation, bathymetry, uh, shown in the second column. Uh, as some of you may already know, we already provide uh, heave sensors for um, platforms that retrieve uh, rockets from famous launch companies, uh, which we're very proud of. Um, we're also looking at um, getting into more into the aerospace market. That's not a market that we have historically been uh, very strong in, but uh, we intend with this product to push deeper into the aerospace market. Um, I think this product's great for things such as uh, satellite communication, uh, pointing and stabilizing of uh, sensor and gimbal platforms, um, those kinds of uh, aerospace uses, I think are going to become much more um, prevalent for this product. And then finally on the right, industrial applications, robotics, autonomous vehicles, 3D mapping systems, this product is, is perfect for, uh, for any of those particular uh, areas. So we're going to do the application space here. Um, what we try to divide it out into is uh, areas where we feel this uh, product fits most specifically. And um, I'm delighted to see that uh, we put GNS aided navigation first here, and that was the whole question that brought in the biggest number of responses. So um, looks like we got it right on that one, thank goodness. Autonomous vehicles, UAVs, UGVs, uh, eVTOLs, these are all the kinds of applications that we are looking at for this product uh, when integrated with your choice of um, GNSS receiver or GPS receiver alone. Um, pointing and stabilizing again as we move to the right, um, another great application area for this product. One of the great things about this particular IMU is that it is so small and so light that you can mount it directly onto your gimbal or onto your pan and tilt head right next to your sensor, whether it's a LiDAR or an EOS sensor. And, um, you don't have to worry about doing some kind of strap down system with an IMU way back in the uh, bowels of your hardware. It can be right on the um, right on the motion head itself. And then finally on the right hand side, an area that um, we are very deeply involved in right now and that's post-processing applications. As I think a lot of you hopefully know, we also offer 
Kenosha post-processing software, uh, which gives you centimeter level accuracy on post-process data where you, for example, don't have good access to RTK data or the RTK data was not good. And this product fits perfectly in with that, with that product line as well. Um, it, it allows you to, um, to put together your navigation system, collect your position data, and marry it up with your LiDAR imagery or your EOS sensor data or your bathymetry, and then transport all that data seamlessly over to our QInertia uh, mapping software and be able to see exactly um, how good your mapping accuracy is, for example, and um, and review what you need to do, uh, either with that data in uh, in the future, or um, or how to actually make decisions based on what on the data you've actually collected. Okay, this is where I thought I was. So yeah. at this point, I'm going to hand it back over to Alan, and he will do the ex the experts part one. Thank you, Sean. Uh, we're going to open up the. Uh, broadcast the, the webinar to some questions from the audience and the first one comes in for you Sean uh, some exact <clears throat> excuse me some curiosity about exact figures for precision size performance bias stability and maturity level yeah uh, these are all extremely good questions um, the um, this product is, okay this product uh, is, is basically it's a tactical grade IMU, as we, as we mentioned earlier on, 0.8 uh, degrees per hour bias instability, very low angle random walk, uh, very comparable to uh, what is required for many navigation applications. And it comes in an extremely small swap, 20 grams, 11 cubic centimeters, and less than three watts. I mean, those are industry leading numbers they're not the kind of numbers that you're going to find everywhere in the marketplace today at all. This product is perfect for um, is perfect for uh, integration. Um, it's designed to be mounted directly onto a circuit card assembly or printed circuit board. And we also provide um, a starter kit, which makes it super easy to get up to speed on this product. It's a USB interface. You plug it into your laptop. And you start talking to the device immediately. And if you have any problems, we have people online, um, and uh, we have actually a web page, and we have direct support uh, online for people who uh, who may have any issues. So it's very mature. Um, it's in production. You can buy it today. Uh, you can hopefully place an order right out after this webinar, and um, hopefully that answers the question. All right. Thank you. Uh, have a fairly long and detailed question for you, Alexis. Uh, I'll, I'll just read it out, and then you can take it. Uh, uh, one audience member says, I'm glad that you noted how Allen variance is very limited and that vibration rectification calibration is also needed. It seems that 99% of analysts, even including experts, are oblivious to all that. Is SBG open to providing extensive calibration coefficients in compliance to a header record for a new IMU standard? Do you agree that Allen variance parameters found under stationary lab conditions are inapplicable under high dynamics? That's a mouthful, but uh, we'll, uh, or perhaps several, but I'll, I'll turn it over to you, Alexis, uh, to, uh, to answer that. Yeah, th thank you. Uh, thank you for the question. So. Um, yeah, I think it, that's an in, interesting comment, um, uh, reminding that uh, the, the lacks of, uh, of Allen variance um, um, analysis. Uh, of course, the Allen variance is uh, only uh, measured in a, in a lab environment at stationary temperature, for instance. So it doesn't really reflect um, how the system will behave. Um, uh, how the system will behave in, in real conditions, like uh, if you have a thermal uh, variation, if you have vibrations, if you have dynamics. So, uh, of course, uh, this is only um, um, yeah, a limited uh, a way of, uh, of um, analyzing the sensor performance. I still believe that it's a, a, an important aspect. We, we, we need to have a look at, at that, um, at, at Allen variance. Um, 
Um, but uh, but yeah, the, there are much limitations on that. Um, and um, and uh, regarding the making a new a new standard, so I, I am not really sure if I understood exactly the question. Maybe I think this this could be uh, addressed uh, uh, offline. Uh, we could probably have a, a, an offline discussion. But uh, thank you anyway for the for the for the comment. All right, thank you, Alexis. And uh, I want to uh, emphasize to the audience that we do have people reviewing the questions. So uh, even if uh, I'm not able to get to them on the air, uh, you will get an answer uh, from the experts at SPG Systems. Uh, Sean, uh, another question for you. How does the how does the Pulse Forty compare uh, in uh, in uh, uh, costs and limitations uh, to other uh, IMUs on the market? Yeah, it's a good question. The main difference between the Pulse 40 IMU and the next best alternatives, if you want to phrase it that way, um, are that basically the Pulse 40 IMU is an OEM product and it's designed specifically for very high volume applications. We have in mind applications that would require over 10,000 units annually for this kind of product. It's not necessarily a product where you're just going to buy one or two and build a system and that's it. Um, it's certainly a product that, uh, that we think has very high applicability and uh, very broad ranging applicability. In conjunction with that, the false party was developed, as I said earlier, it's developed for deep systems integration. Um, and uh, what I meant by that was that you can use, for example, you know, pick and place techniques to put the Pulse 40 on your boards as part of your automatic assembly line. Um, all of those things are going to reduce not just the initial cost of purchasing the product, but the costs associated with integrating, developing, testing, and manufacturing. So all of these things have been considered um, in the development and design of the Pulse 40, and it sets it apart from other people's tactical grades I use, quite frankly. The other thing is, is that the FOS40 is it's um, it's deployed as an integral part of your hardware system, and it's not an extend you know it's not an external appendage. It's not another box on the end of a cable or power supply or interface. It's actually deeply embedded in your system. Uh, it gains all of the protections of your system housing and hardware design, and reduces your overall system uh, volume and cost considerably. So. I think there's a lot of advantages in the tactical grade marketplace that aren't addressed by other products right now, and um, um, we're very optimistic that people will recognize those advantages quickly and uh, integrate this into their systems design. Thank you. Uh, we're going to keep you busy, Sean, by uh, turning right back to you in the second half of your presentation. But first, we will have a poll question for the audience. Uh, Lori, go ahead and take it away. Absolutely. Coming up on the screen is that second poll question. And the question is, what is the most important feature for your IMU? And although on the screen it does say uh, select all that apply, we'd like to ask you um, on the honor system here to select your top two options. So top two we're looking for um, size, weight, and power, performance, qualification, reliability data, direct integration on PCB, or rugged design. So it looks like we're coming in with 54% size, weight, and power, 83% performance, 35% a qualification reliability data, 9% direct integration on PCB, and 19% rugged design. So Alan, any thoughts here? Well, other than that not too many people are uh, highly invested in direct integration, uh, I'm going to turn to Sean for commentary on this. Yeah, thank you, Alan. I appreciate it. So this is not out of line, I don't think at all, with what we would have anticipated for a tactical grade IMU. Um, performance, I think, for this kind of product is always key in people's minds, and especially when you see that the um, number one application that people are interested in is uh, for navigation. For navigation during GPS outages, GNSS outages, the, the IMU has to deliver. It has to have good bias performance. It has to have good 
noise performance, and it has to be extremely stable. So no surprises uh, on performance as being the number one category. And I think we deliver there. I think if you look at the numbers, the Pulse 40 IMU delivers in that category, and um, and I'm not concerned at all. I think we have uh, I think we have a great offering. Number two, size, weight, and power. Again, um, again, I'm not surprised. Um, people don't want large, unwieldy boxes that consume huge amounts of power, huge amounts of volume, and, and add weight to their system. A lot of the pit systems that uh, people are fielding like the, uh, these days, such as uh, very lightweight UAVs, can't handle those um, those kinds of requirements. They need something that, uh, that that they can fly, and so having low swap is uh, is perfect. And and uh, the Pulse 40 IMU meets those needs head on. So I'm happy to see that as well. I think the direct integration on PCB. Just a comment on that. Um, people haven't had that available to them in the past, and so they've been used to having to deal with big boxes with lots of cables and power supplies and uh, you know, interfaces that they don't like. So um, it may take a while for people to get used to the fact that they've now got an option to put something directly on their circuit guard assembly and integrate it deeply into their system. And that could be a new game changer for us. Thank you, Sean. Uh, I see the questions uh, coming in. We will have another longer question and answer period uh, concluding the webinar after the second half of Sean's presentation, and one from Emery. But for now, let's let's go back to uh, applications, part two, Sean. Thank you, Alan. OK, so we're going to touch here in this section, a uh, short section, on some of the things that we talked about in terms of uses of the product uh, at the beginning. And uh, we're just going to highlight a couple. We're not going to go through every single one exhaustively. Uh, we'll just pick a couple and uh, explain why we think this IMU is uh, well suited for these specific applications. First one we're going to start with is pointing and stabilization. Maybe I should have started with NAV, but that's the way the slides are. And what we've got here on this chart basically is we've got a table on the left where we put down some of the uh, key requirements for each application. There's a list. It's not exhaustive. It's sort of the probably top four or five that people know, normally look for. And then why the Pulse 40 delivers in terms of its performance numbers uh, and how these key into um, how you use this part uh, this product in a specific application. So the Pulse 40 IMU has a lot of great characteristics for this particular set of applications. It's very high bandwidth. Um, you need a high bandwidth in order to be able to very, be responsive to the motion of the platform. 480 hertz is a very, very, very respectable number for this kind of an IMU and um, it allows you to use it in uh, systems with very uh, high dynamics. The data rate, again, equally uh, 2 kilohertz. This is a very uh, high data rate output uh, serial data stream. And that's what we have heard people are looking for these days. They want high data rate data. Uh, they want to be able to pass it themselves and decide how to analyze and utilize that data. Uh, they don't want people doing their own processing and averaging. Um, and so that's why we provide it in this format. The device has extremely low latency. Two milliseconds is is extremely good for both the Excel and gyro channels. Um, this means that obviously the system is keeping up with the motions that it's sensing and provides you with timely information on how to close the loop on your system and maintain stability or whatever it is that's key to you in the, in this particular world. The noise is low. Um, Got to have low noise, obviously. If you don't have low noise, then your antenna or your EO sensor is going to be bouncing around um, uncontrollably, and that's not a good idea. So 0 0.08 degrees per root hour is an extremely good number um, and feeds right into pointing and stabilizing applications. And finally, um, temperature range. Uh, every, everyone needs um, systems that operate over a wide temperature range these days. A lot of these systems are used uh, in a wide variety of environmental conditions uh, outside. Different parts of the world, uh, they see different solar loadings at different times of the day, different diurnal cycles. So having full calibration is a must, and uh, we provide minus 40 to plus 85 degrees C. From an NF standpoint, um, we think this is a ideal product for navigation and mapping applications, and we have a lot of experience in both of these areas ourselves. 
the uh, again the chart has the same format as a prior chart key, key requirements on the left what the pulse 40 IMU delivers uh, on the right hand side of the table and then why this is important scale factor error on the uh, uh, pulse 40 IMU is 1500 ppm I want to make it clear that this is this is not just a sort of a, a one day <laughs> scale factor measurement this is what you're going to see over um, over the lifetime of the product this is derived directly from our whole testing and is um, you're not going to see anything worse than this over 12 months of continuous operation we guarantee that it will be 1500 ppm it won't be a thousand ppm on day one and 6000 ppm on day 10. the gyro has a very good bias instability and this is your minima of the allen's variance curve 0.8 degrees per hour and as uh, Alexi mentioned earlier on this gyro stays below one degree an hour for a long, 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 long time. And um, that's probably even more important than the actual value that you see here is the fact that it's, um, that it's consistent over an extended period of time. It, large changes in this with time are, are not good for, for navigation systems. They just don't like it. The Excel VRW is, um, again, extremely low. It's expressed here, obviously, in terms of the number of G's and noise that you'd experience as a function of frequency, but it's uh, it, it's very quiet. These accelerometers are extremely quiet, um, and, uh, and that matches in with what you need from navigation also. Bit coverage on this product is excellent. Uh, we provide you with continuous, we provide you with both startup and continuous bit, and the continuous bit is 100%, um, and um, that's for the sensor cluster and the processing involved with um, with the data. So, uh, and we can provide further details on, on exactly what that covers if uh, if people have um, an interest in knowing. And again, we use the MEL standard HNG as our um, benchmark against which to do a qualification on this product, which is uh, basically what most people anticipate that they will be, be delivered in an attachable grade IMU these days. Uh, although it's not always available for a um, OEM style IMU. If you look at the advantages of this um, over uh, alternate technologies, alternate uh, ways of putting together IMUs, um, obviously the biggest uh, advantages I think that we offer right now are, um, are related to packaging. What you're getting from the Pulse 40 is you're getting a full six degree of freedom IMU that's smaller than a single axis fiber optic gyro, ring laser gyro, or spinning mass gyro. So uh, from a packaging standpoint, um, this is the product to pick. And you're going to get very similar to performance to low-end uh, fog and uh, other forms of gyroscopes that, uh, that are in the marketplace today, but in a package that, that just uh, is unmatched. The product not only um, is unmatched in terms of size, weight, and power, but it's also extremely resilient to shock. Um, MEMS inherently is more resilient to shock than both ring laser gyros and fiber optic gyros. Um, any of you that have ever used either of those two products in environments that have high shock or high vibration, uh, you know that they can have issues uh, with mechanical failure. That's typically mechanical failure between the, for example, the fiber or the light source or the detector, which renders the device completely inoperable. Um, you're not going to get this with this kind of MEMS device. If you get any kind of failure at all, it's going to be a gradual degradation. It will not be uh, instant lights out. The other thing that's um, very uh, amazing with these devices is the uh, MTBF. The uh, mean time between failure for the uh, Pulse 40 IMU um, is being offered at 50,000 hours. And so if you compare that to other devices, it, this is an extremely high number. Um, there are other devices on the market, uh, ring laser gyro devices, for example, where if the MTBF is only 2,000 hours. Um, so be careful when you decide which product you decide to pick for your system that it's going to last for your uh, system design lifetime goals. And finally, uh, ease of integration and use. This product is designed to be usable straight out of the box. Uh, you don't have to be an IMU expert. You don't have to be an initial systems expert. Um, you can have this product uh, as a standalone item or as a starter kit. 
on the starter kit. It comes with a USB cable. You can plug it directly into your computer. It's on its own breakout board, and you can start collecting data uh, immediately, which is, uh, I think, is a big benefit for this product over um, other systems where you got to figure out, okay, what kind of drivers do I need? How am I going to hook it up? What kind of power do I need? Don't worry about any of that. It it will work immediately. We also have a um, the SPG system is very proud of this. We have a great dedicated online support resource system. I think probably they have the best uh, support system that I've seen of any initial products company, frankly. Um, the website is outstanding. Everything you need to know about the product is available on the website. Um, how you log the data, how you capture data, how you make changes to the IMU, it's all explained in detail. There's a quick start guide, there's a user manual, and we have real people, life, real life people that you can call and talk to and they will walk you through how to use this product. So very user friendly, um, designed to get you up and running in the shortest amount of time possible. Okay, back to you Alan for the next section. Thank you, Sean. We're going to take an in-depth technical look at the Pulse 40, the calibration, qualification, and a number of other factors. And this is going to be courtesy of Emeric Lemercier, a uh, test and qualification engineer at SBG Systems. He has a master's degree in science in general engineering with a specialization in hydrography and oceanography from Enste Bretagne. In the inertial field since 2017, he is in charge of MEMS sensor tests and IMU calibration at SBG Systems. Emeric, uh, let's take uh, let's take that in-depth look. Thank you, Alan. I will talk about the technical overview of the Pulse 40. So to do that, first we will talk about the manufacturing process. Then we will proceed by the IMU qualification and specification and we will conclude by the sensor cluster. When, I, when we talk about overall process flow of the Pulse 40, we need to understand that SBG system is, is manufacturing the, the project, then is doing the calibration, the storage, and we finish by the validation. This section won't talk about the manufacturing process, but we will go deeply in the calibration step the storage and the validation step and the validation. SBG system developed uh, its own software to do the calibration. So I put here an example of the interface. So it's SBG prod acquisition. So you can select the operator, the type of IMU you want to calibrate, and then select the application you, you want to do. The there are, several, there are several applications, like flash the QR code, acquire the calibration data, then compute the model, acquire the validation data, and finish the acceptance test. If we want to talk a bit about the first flash QR code and identify device, you can see here the purse. There is a QR code, and you can flash it, and it flash inside the device the name of the IMU, and you can have full trustability with the connected ERP system. Then, when we have this product, we, we want to calibrate it. So, SVG developed its own in calibration interface. So, you can put up to 36 pulse 40 in one or one calibration. The calibration lasts 13 hours. And this calibration interface is just put in the two axes red table climatic chamber to do the calibration. When we talk about calibration, we want to compensate the sensor errors, the sensor errors from the accelerometers and the gyroscopes. To do that, we use the red, the red table to simulate rotation, position, and thermal environment. The main idea is to compare the sensor output to the stimulus from the, the table. Here I put the equation. On the left part, we have the sensor ideal output, and we have also the sensor real output from the accelerometer or the gyroscope. And the idea will be to, to find the compensation to make the sensor really quite fit to the sensor ideal output. Here I put one of the uh, errors. The first part is the scale factor error. So 
the the green curve represents the table the the table movement and the blue curve represents the sensor output. The idea here is just to apply a coefficient, the scale factor, to make it fit, fit the green curve and the blue curve. The second error is the bias, is BS, and we can see that there is an offset, so we need to apply an offset to correct this, this error. The third part is the non-linearity. Non this error is quite difficult to compensate, and SBD do it with taking a function of the sensor real output. And then at the fourth part is the, the WS is the noise that the sensor really had directly. At the end of the calibration, we need to find the sensor model to do the compensation for the bias, the scale factor, and the triad element. And with this, this, this compensation, we can compute the calibration report, which showed the residual error. Here I put two examples, one for the gyroscope and one for the accelerometer. They both have sweep. So we have the thermal variation from minus 40 degrees C to 80 degrees C, and we can see the bias error in micro G or in degree per hour for the, for the project, the residual. And we have the requirement and we have the statute to know if this test was good or not, and also the global statistics on the data. We can add that also we look at the thermal hysteresis of the of the calibration, which is quite, is quite important for our project. Then after the calibration, we do storage. It can go from one week to a month. The idea is to know if the sensor model is really stable. And we, we, we with that part, we can see if there is any drift in the model. After the storage, we can go to the independent validation. This cons it consists in six hours test uh, with three independent points on power, power from minus 10 degree, 20 degree C, and 60 degree C. I put here the report and the three first part term are for the bias. Then we have the noise, the scale factor, and the nonlinearity. And we finish by the triad we have parameters, we have the requirement then, and the status, and so we have a global status on the, on the test. And when we finish this, we finish the final acceptance test, and the validation report, and the, the, the first part of the final acceptance test, then we will need to do the second part of the acceptance test. The last part of the acceptance test is done at open temperature. And it's a functional test. We want to know the power consumption, the signal sample out, the statues, and also how the gyroscope and the accelerometer are, are, are compliant with our requirement. And then when this is full passed with the statue, we can upload the customer firmware and we will generate a fully automated PDF report, which will be uploaded to the SBG cloud. This concludes the production, and now we have a status of the project at the fresh at the first time at the first time. And now we want to know what the IMU, what are the IMU real specification and qualification. So we need to do tests for the temperature, vibration, electromagnetic environment, and time. This part is quite hard and needs a lot of equipment and data anal analysis. To do the data analysis. SBG system also developed a tool to, that will be able to take the data from the calibration and validation and do the analysis of all the data of the IMU in time or temperature. This is really inter interesting to see any drift in the manufacturing process. So here I put an extract of the SBG prod test. So you can select the date here is from the 10th of November 2021 to the 2nd of February 2022. The expression is from validation, accelerometer. We are looking for the scale factor, all axis and all temperature. So this generates a result of 162 data. And then we can have the, the statistic and we can also plot the, the distribution of the data.
So here we can see quickly a Gaussian on the data distribution of the scale factor on the 162 accelerometer. Then we, we did the data analysis on the calibration, but we need a full qualification plan to, to pursue the test. So we have several tests like the start, startup at high and low temperature. Here I put the figure of this test. So we, the equipment is on at 20 degrees C, then we go to the max temperature, the equipment is switched off. We just wait one hour, then we just start the acquisition after one hour, we just go then to the low temperature, we just switch off the equipment and then we just switch, switch on the equipment after one hour and then we can see the variation and if the system is compliant with start of high and low temperature. We do also vibration and the random and sinus, we will talk about this later. We look also the bias after shock on the accelerometer and the gyroscope, the stability of noise. We also do check on the CBIT analysis. We will talk about this a bit more later. And we also look at test and qualification for electromagnetic compliance. But this is not enough to, to, to qualify our IMU. We need also to do tests for like accelerated aging to estimate how the, the IMU, what, what will be the performance of the IMU after one year. So this is done with hot storage 10 day from 10 day at 85 degrees C, cold storage three days at 50, uh, minus 50 degrees C, temperature cycling, logistic vibration shock, logistic vibration and shock, power on of 106 cycle and power on 50 hours. At every step, we are evaluating the performance of the IMU to know if what are the drift in the, in the performance. Now, if I want to talk a bit about stability, we also do tests with Alan Valence, like uh, said Alexi, to, to look at the performance of our IMU. Here, I put the calibration plates. 13 IMU were in this, in this plate, and we were at the temperature, and acquisition were done for 12 hours. So here is the raw data, and then we, we compute the Alan variances, and you can see that here, we don't have this drift is occurring on the gyroscope on, on the audio, audio gyroscope. Now, if you want to talk a bit more about vibration, we do sinus and random vibration. The main idea is to measure the accelerometer bandwidth, vibration rectification error, frequency resonance, and behavior under and after shock. Here, I put the plus 40 on, on the shaker. The first curve show the performance of IMU and the random vibration on frequency 20 hertz to 2,000 kilo, 2,000 hertz, and from random vibration 1 GRMS to 10 GRMS. Here you can see the bias shift, which, uh, which is known as the vibration rectification error. And then you can compute the vibration rectification correction. Here I put another test here on a sign sweep on the shaker from 20 hertz to 2,000 hertz. And uh, with 5G peak, and you can see that at the beginning, we can see the movement and then the movement disappear. With this decreasing, we can just evaluate the bandwidth of uh, the accelerometer. Now we talk about qualification, but SBG system is also known to use cluster technology. And the plus 40 really benefits from, from this. So we will talk a bit like what is a sensor? the advantage of using a sensor, and what are the challenges and issues to overcome. The idea be behind uh, cluster is the fact that the main sensors are really tiny, and you can really take it into account in your, in, in your architecture. And so the main idea be between the, the, the cluster is to reduce noise. It's known that when you use a cluster, you can expect a one over square root of n decreasing in white noise. But we can improve other parameters, thermal stability, the linearity, the vibration behavior, and, and the reliability. Here I put an example of a bias stability of a gyroscope. 
the green curve represents one gyroscope by stability. The red curve represents six virtual gyro uh, by stability. And at one time second, you can see that we're really decreasing the white noise for one over square root of six. And you can also see that the bias stability is increased with the cluster. But as we, we put several clusters in our system, there are challenges to face. We can't sample sampling a lot of MEM sensors, so we need to define what are the performance, the targeted performances. We need also to know how we can synchronize all the sensors. Then we will have also to adapt the calibration tool and know also what we have, what we will be doing with good and bad sensors. Here I put the SDG cluster. So how we do to implement the cluster in the Pulse 40. During the calibration, all the, the sensors in the cluster are monitored. And then we apply complex and finely tuned weighting factor criteria to, to, uh, to co compute the virtual, uh, the virtual gyroscope or virtual accelerometer. And we also do advanced CD. The weight are evaluated regarding several parameters like noise, thermal specification, and also the MEMS global behavior. The first figure at the top here represents the sensor ID. We have here uh, six, sens six sensors with three axes, and we can see the distribution of the weight factor uh, regarding the noise, the thermal, or, or the MEMS behavior. So, which is quite a good example of how we do, how we implement it in the, the, after the calibration, the weighting factor. And to conclude, I will talk about the, the continuous beam test implemented in the, in the Pulse 40, which can be really important for demanding application. So here we have the acceleration. We can see that some shocks are applied on the Pulse 40. Some statues are raising. We have the accelerometer in range that is really uh, common. But we also have the Y X axis, Y X mix that are arising, which are which are showing that the cluster shows differences between the, the data, the data. So this is quite relevant to the fact that we can just check on how the cluster is really is really behaving, if behavior, what the behavior of the cluster, and if the data are reliable. To conclude, I will say that SVG system as an industrial process for pulse IMU production. So we, we can see that we use two axis rate table. There is a storage then to, to see if the sensor model is really fitted to the IMU. We add um, validation, independent validation, and we have a fully automated um, report display on the cloud. SVG system also do do test to qualify the IMU performance from the calibration data analysis, environmental test, or functional test. And we also guarantee long-term life of long stability of our project. And the sensor cluster technology is also um, a good aspect of our first 40. And this made us about to improve accuracy and stability with also a, a CBIT with 100% coverage tech. So this is how we guarantee that we deliver IMU that meets the specification. It's finished. Back to you, Alan. Thank you, Emeric. Uh, we'll turn to questions uh, in a little bit. Meantime, we have some means for you to contact SBG Systems. Uh, you see them there, North America, EMEA, and uh, Singapore. And you, there's also an option to find your local partner uh, online. And we have some resources for you. Uh, the SBG Systems website, which is, uh, Sean mentioned, is quite extensive, quite helpful, quite in-depth. Uh, there's a leaflet on the Pulse 40 IMU itself. And, uh, and a web page uh, also 
supplying more information on the product. We have uh, an extensive uh, set of questions here. Uh, first question uh, for our SBG experts, what are the impacts of the IMU packaging on the initial MEMS gyro performances, the bias and angle random walk and, and so forth, the other characteristics that you have cited? Um, I, will, I will take this one. Uh, that's a very, very interesting question. Um, actually, this is a, a key um, parameter uh, to, to, to get a, a good IMU. Uh, you, you need to make, to make sure that your packaging is not affecting the performance. Um, it is clear that the MEMS uh, sensors, the MEMS element can be quite sensitive to mechanical stress, for instance. So uh, when exposed to a mechanical stress, the MEMS uh, sensor, the MEMS chip by itself may be affected uh, on the sensor bias. Uh, <clears throat> typically the bias will be, the, the, will be uh, an important uh, aspect, but all, all the sensor characteristics can be affected. So uh, this is why on the Pulse 40 we, uh, we integrated uh, um, uh, a rugged, a robust uh, aluminum design uh, to, that makes sure that all the sensors are rig rigidly uh, installed and will not be affected by any um, constraint uh, uh, done by the integration, uh, by the user integration. Um, we also check that uh, all the sensors are correctly uh, installed within the IMU during our calibration and validation process. Uh, you, can, you can check uh, uh, with every, uh, every single uh, IMU we deliver, there is, a, a, there is an associated uh, validation report that uh, specifies that all the performance characteristics um, of, the, of the sensor to confirm the specs. Thank you. A, qu a question for you, Amérique. Uh, during the calibration, is there any compensation of the IMU cross-axis? Yes, indeed. During the calibration and during the full thermal cycle of calibration, we are measuring the cross-axis. And so we can do the compensation to make sure that we have no problem of alignment, of misalignment at the end of the calibration, so we are fully compliant with the cross-axis compensation with a polynomial. And a question for you, Alexis. Uh, how do you compare with other miniature MEMS IMUs on the market? Um, yeah, um, so technically speaking, uh, there are some other good, uh, some other good IMUs. We will compare mostly with the uh, tactical grade IMUs uh, modules. And what will be a really, really different uh, aspect on our product is really uh, the very, very uh, uh, specific calibration and validation process that, is, that has been designed for a very, very high performance products. Um, and that we deliver also on miniature IMUs, such as the Pulse 40, uh, with a, uh, an individual validation report for every single unit we, we deliver. So that will be probably a key uh, differentiation. Um, the association of a high performance sensors with cutting edge calibration procedure. All right, I'm going to pause the Q&A for a moment. I got so excited by some of these questions that I rushed right into it without giving the audience a chance to, to answer a question. Uh, let's have our final poll, Lori. Let's do it. Okay, coming up on the screen is that uh, poll. And we'd like to hear from each of you. Which performance parameter is the most important for your IMU? Uh, and this one, we're going to ask that you select one response, noise, bandwidth, bias stability, thermal stability, scale factor, linearity. All right. Looks like 16% noise, 16% bandwidth, 54% bias stability, 8% thermal stability, 5% scale factor, linearity. So uh, any thoughts here, Alan? Well, I'm going to defer to Alexis for for this one. Yes, um, we we uh, we can see that uh, of course the bias stability 
uh, is, uh, is, uh, is the major uh, parameter that is analyzed by most of the IMU users. Uh, as I mentioned at the beginning of this um, presentation, this is a key factor for sure, but uh, obviously it is not covering all the aspects uh, of, of an IMU um, performance. Um, noise and bandwidth are also uh, uh, well represented. Um, I am, um, uh, yeah, I think it's important when we consider thermal stability, which is not that well represented, uh, such as also scale factor or linearity. Um, it's important to, to, to remind that the bias stability um, parameter is, uh, is only applicable at a, a purely constant temperature. Uh, so uh, at some point, you, everyone needs uh, some some level, some certain level of, of thermal stability, um, and I think that's a, a, a very important factor to to, to mention. Um, some um, some IMUs that uh, can be, for instance, soldered directly on on a PCB will will have some difficulties to to uh, to maintain these characteristics, for instance. Uh, because of the soldering process that might affect the, the, the calibration. Um, so it's, uh, for us, it's a, a quite important uh, factor to, to make sure that the IMU will behave in all the conditions. Um, and, uh, of course, the bias stability remains a, an important factor for us as well. Emeric, a question for you. Is the Pulse 40 able to measure the Earth rotation? Actually, the Pulse 40 is quite, has, has quite good um, capacities when we look at capabilities when we look, when we look at the noise and everything. So, indeed, we can think that it's about to, to measure Earth rotation, but as we have problem at the startup bias, we cannot really have a, a fully measure of the S rotation if we don't know the bias at the startup. But during the calibration, we take into account the S rotation to do the compensation. Thank you. And uh, Alexis, uh, is a question about the internal sampling frequency. Is it limited to uh, two kilohertz um, yeah that's a good question um, the uh, the internal uh, main loop uh, which is running all the calibration algorithms uh, and uh, and the uh, the output generation is running at two kilohertz that's uh, that's for sure um, but it's important to remind that we have uh, the internal accelerometers and gyroscopes that are sampled at a higher frequency uh, so it's 4 kilohertz for accelerometers and 6.6 uh, kilohertz for gyros. Um, this um, oversampling uh, allows to reduce the noise as much as possible, uh, increase the, um, um, the resolution of the uh, uh, internal ADC, uh, and, uh, and it will also improve the performance in uh, vibrating uh, conditions. And a question about uh, aging. Do you apply an aging step on the sensors before calibration? Yes, that's, uh, that's also an important aspect on the, on the calibration uh, process. So we have, um, we have always a uh, uh, kind of uh, accelerated uh, aging through process that, that is performed before the calibration. To, to stabilize the sensor characteristics before we, uh, we apply the calibration. Yeah, thank you. And a final question, just to wrap up, uh, a fitting one to wrap up. Uh, Emily, how are the calibration, validation, and specification criteria evaluated? To do the evaluation and to do the requirement for calibration or validation, we are using the SBG Pro tool and statistic to evaluate the RMS and all the three sigma, the one sigma or the three sigma value. And this allows us to have a good representation of the performance of the IMU as we have a lot of 
and you test it on our facilities or our equipment. Thank you. Well, we've uh, wrapped up right on time as it turns out, so uh, good on everyone. Uh, I'm going to send the microphone around the virtual panel for to give uh, each of our speakers a chance to uh, have a concluding comment. Let's hear from Alexis, then Sean, and Emeric. Uh, Alexis? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, everyone, for, for attending this uh, webinar. I think there was very, uh, very interesting uh, uh, presentations and also very interesting questions from the from the the audience. So I am really glad uh, that uh, we have we had this opportunity this opportunity to uh, to discuss about all these technical aspects. Sean, <coughs> sorry, thank you, Alan. Yeah, it was extremely good webinar. I enjoyed it uh, tremendously, and uh, hopefully the enthusiasm will continue to build as we roll this product out and it gets into the hands of the uh, end users. So feel free, um, whoever's on the other end of the line, please feel free to reach out to our sales organization at SBG. Uh, the contact information is provided. Um, we're willing to provide you with whatever data you need on this product line, uh, quotes, technical, uh, support, whatever it happens to be, and we look forward to hearing from everyone. Emeric. Yeah, thank you. It was really interesting to go deep inside our technical calibration, qualification, and the cluster. It was a really challenging topic to address, and it was really, really interesting to, to present this today. Thank you, gentlemen, for uh, all your perspectives and for the information on this exciting new product. Thanks to SBG Systems for sponsoring the webinar. Uh, I'm Alan Cameron at Inside GNSS Magazine and Inside Unmanned Systems, where in the latter magazine uh, you'll see a brief webinar recap. You will also receive a, a link to uh, to review, revisit, uh, re-experience the webinar, and to share it with your colleagues, anyone else who may be interested. Thanks again, everyone, for attending, and have a wonderful day. Lori? Thank you, Alan, and uh, again, thanks for joining us. This is Lori Dearman saying, hope we see you on the next one. Bye for now.